If you live or work with teen girls, you certainly don't need me to tell you that they can be way out there with their emotions. And you already know that girl friendships can be fraught with drama, misunderstandings, betrayals, and recriminations. Which just proves that being emotional doesn't automatically translate into high emotional intelligence, aka getting real with yourself so you can be real with the people you're close to. When teen girl emotion explodes around parents, they often do what moms and dads of my parents' generation did, try to contain and sanitize the feelings. Why? Perhaps some parents sincerely believe that people who are too emotional get clobbered by life. Or another possibility is that when confronted with a girl's outburst that parents can't fix, the next best solution is to try to shut it down as quickly as possible. Either way, the message is that some emotions are just not the good girl kind. If a girl expresses sadness, she may hear, Cheer up! Can't be all that bad. If she expresses fear, she might get, There's nothing to be afraid of. If she rages over some real or imagined injustice, she may be treated to some variation of this 20th century chestnut. Better watch it, young lady. You're getting a little too big for your britches. When I was a child, the most powerful phrase I knew was, Shut up! Only used in a rare moment of frustration and laughably tame by today's standards, those words were consistent showstoppers in my family. Always followed by, Young lady, that language is unacceptable. I realize now that it was my assertiveness that was truly unacceptable. 21st century parental messages to girls haven't changed all that much. Don't be sad. Don't be scared. Don't be angry. Oh, and while you're at it, don't be so shy. Don't be worried. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be so silly. Don't be so dramatic. Don't be so smart. If girls can't be any of those things, what in heaven's name are they supposed to be? Duh. They're supposed to be good. At all times, sweet, loving, and cooperative, modest, supportive, nurturing, generous, and nice. But what are girls supposed to do when any of those other not-so-good, not-so-nice feelings pop up? No problem. If you want to be a good girl, yes, please, you certainly learn to stuff it and smile. I'm Annie Fox, and this is Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. Today's show, Good Girl versus Real Girl. My guest today is Rachel Simmons, author of the new book, The Curse of the Good Girl, Raising Authentic Girls with Courage and Confidence. Rachel Simmons is also the author of the 2002 New York Times bestseller, Odd Girl Out, The Hidden Culture of Aggression in Girls, the first book to explore the phenomenon of bullying among girls. Rachel works internationally with girls, parents, and teachers to develop strategies to address bullying and to empower girls. A Rhodes Scholar, Rachel Simmons is the founding director of the Girls Leadership Institute and currently serves as a consultant to schools and organizations around the world. Welcome to Family Confidential, Rachel. Thank you. I'm really glad that you're here, and I, I want to get right into talking about the curse of the good girl, because I know I was one, I still am, and to some degree, trying to lose some of that goodness. But I wanted you to quickly define for our audience, what is a good girl? A good girl is someone who's fundamentally trying to be someone she's not. So she's trying to be nice all the time, friends with everyone, liked by everyone, and she's, she's modest, but at the same time, she wants to do everything perfectly. So she usually works really hard at school, takes her grades really seriously, but is also often devastated by a single mistake. So it's someone who is trying so hard to be better and better, but I think is also aspiring to something that's not possible. Mm. So she ends up feeling never good enough. Wow, that sounds like a lot of American women, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's also sort of this line, it's always good to be into self-improvement and to strive and to be aspirational. But when you're striving for something that takes you away from who you are and that's rigged against you, you know, that's where you're crossing the line. 
That sounds like a recipe for neuroses. Well, I could write that recipe book. <laughs> Tell me, were you a good girl? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I wasn't actually. It's funny, I had an eighth grade teacher show up at one of my readings at a Barnes and Noble, and I thought, this is hilarious because I was actually a bad girl in your class. Oh, <laughs> my mom taught at my school. I had a real reputation for misbehavior. So I think. And I think like lots of people, you know, very few people meet that classic good girl stereotype. I think we tend to have it affect us in different ways. So for me growing up, you know, I think for me it was about playing a perfect basketball game and being really, really upset by one error or doing really well in school. But that doesn't mean I did really well in school all the time. So you may not be performing up to par, but you may be internally punishing yourself when you don't. Hmm. That that seems like a definition that fits a lot of people. I get email from girls from around the world and have been on the receiving end of these missives for the last 12 years. And often I will get what sounds like the resume of a girl who's got it all together. And then at the bottom of the email, she'll tell me about how she's stressing and how she can't tell her parents about the fact that she's cutting or in some way putting herself down or or being self-destructive. And the reason she can't tell her parents, she says in the email, is because they think my life is perfect. And my inner sense about that is not that they think her life is perfect, but that she thinks her parents need her life to look perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's probably true. And I think I think girls are hyper attuned to how other people are feeling and thinking. And even, I mean, I've had plenty of parents say to me, I'm not telling her to, that she has to be perfect at school. Where is she picking this up? And what do you say? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think girls get a lot of rewards internally for being good. And they get those rewards in subtle ways from their family, from their teachers, from their peers. Um, And you may get a false sense of yourself by being told, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're such a good student. And you start relying on those external assessments such that you, you need to be that person in order to feel good about yourself. And so it may actually not even be what your parents are necessarily telling you, but a sense that if you're not like this, well, then who are you and, and do you have any value? It's really interesting. Those messages, some of them are subtle. Some of them are not so subtle. I remember getting an email from a mom. This is, sounds crazy to me. But she was trying to protect her daughter from some teasing the daughter was getting because of the daughter's particular fashion sense. The girl liked to wear what she wanted to wear. And so mom struck a bargain with the girl that three days a week when the girl went to school, she could wear what she wanted to wear. But two days a week, she needed to wear Abercrombie and Fitch or whatever the other girls were wearing. And the mom thought that this was a really good solution just so then she would be teased less. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? Yeah, that's pretty extreme. I mean, I think obviously the parent is operating from a position of wanting to protect her child. But of course, she's the one who's making the decision. And it's not her who's in that school eight hours a day, you know, locked into that building. And um, a lot of times these interventions from parents come from a really well-intentioned place, but are often undermining their daughter's ability to cope on their own. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so many young people, particularly from middle and upper middle class environments, not possessing the coping skills they need. It's really interesting that the subtitle of your book, it's called The Curse of the Good Girl, Raising Authentic Girls with Courage and Confidence. And I'm particularly struck by the word courage, because if you are in fact in that snake pit from nine to three and extended to the after school hours. And what's going on there is the antithesis of support for being a real girl versus a good girl. Then it takes a tremendous amount of courage to be who you are. It does. And the psychologist Annie Rogers wrote uh, an article about courage in girls, and she defines courage as um, to speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. What Annie Rogers is saying, though, is that that part of what courage really entails is being able to share what's inside your heart with other people. And that, for many girls, becomes very dangerous territory. But that's exactly what we need to arm girls with the skills to do. And yeah, not every friend is going to be able to hear you speak your mind and tell your heart. But that's also part of growing up, is learning, you know what, this friend isn't so good for me, but this friend is better. The problem comes in where we want girls to have these problem-free social lives. Without those problems, they're not going to learn their own navigation. That makes perfect sense. And if you as a mom or as a teacher 
aren't there yet in your own development, how the hell are you supposed to be a mentor and a guide for girls in that direction? It's really, really hard. And I tell parents all the time, I say, you know what, if you're having a bad day, and you need to like solve all her problems today, you should go do that. Like, that's okay, because you can't manage the idea of not doing that. And, and you feel so helpless. But when you do feel up to it, it is so crucial to do two things with your girl. Firstly, empathize with her, you know, tell her you're sorry for what she's going through, hug her, hold her, this is a step that many parents forget in the rush to fix things. Mm -hmm. And the second thing you do is you say, what do you want to do about this? How do you want to handle this? If you don't do that, you are not allowing your daughter to develop these crucial muscles that she's going to need to choose the right relationship. So you can, you can pay now by watching her struggle, or you can pay later when you have a, a young adult who can't cope on her own. But you've got to pay at some point. That is part of the cost of being a parent. It sucks. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying if you're having a bad day, don't do it. But if today maybe you have the courage, sit on your hands and put something in hers. That's really important. And I'm picturing this mom who's hugging the girl who's really upset because her friends turned against her and she had no one to sit with at lunch and people are sending her all kinds of evil messages. And I'm picturing the mom, but but the picture in my mind is not, you know, what do you want to do about that, which is very effective parenting. The picture mom in my mind is saying, how can I help you? And it's like, tell me what I can do. And what girl is going to say in that vulnerable moment, you know, back off and let me do it myself, mom. Right. But I think you're right, Annie. I think you, you do have to say, what can I do for you? And I think that's an excellent corollary to what, what I'm saying. But to say, this is what we're going to do, and this is what you need to do, actually is delaying the more important lesson. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I'm wondering how moms in general, how can they possibly work out this stuff that they've got from their own legacy, which is going to make them so much more tuned in to what their daughters really need from them versus what the moms are perpetuating. I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I've been thinking about the way in which, as an adult, the heartbreaks that we experience make us stronger people. And I've been lately talking to parents and saying, you know, think about the times that your heart has been broken as an adult. And, and for most people, it's in a relationship that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Now, in the immediate aftermath of having your heart broken, if someone were to ask you, you know, is this a good thing for you? Most people are not going to say yes. Oh, no, it was awful. I'm suffering. <laughs> it was hideous. It was horrible. But actually, you let a little time pass. And most people are going to tell you that that was actually a really important moment in their life because it gave them standards for a relationship that they never had before. It made them tougher. It made them see that they could survive something really hard. It gave them a hardiness internally. And I think that parents could benefit in those moments in which they look at their daughters and they think, I can't bear to watch her suffer. I must fix this. Remember and connect with that most recent heartbreak that you have experienced and think about what it gave you. Would you not go through that now? Mm. And who would you be if you hadn't gone through it? And maybe from that, parents can uh, get a little bit more gumption to let their daughters go through some of that heartbreak on their own. Because honestly, resilience isn't mostly going to come from any other place. I agree with that completely. I often counsel parents to think about what their parenting objectives are for their kids. And they're really good about giving a list of things that they would like their sons and daughters to grow up equipped with. And those include, you know, honesty, independence, self-confidence, social responsibility, caring, a whole slew of things, financial independence, passion about their work, all of these things. And these are all great and, you know, you can carve them in stone and, and, you know, walk under an archway into your living room every single day. But the other part of it is what are we as parents doing to actually work towards these objectives from our parenting university? What are we doing to help our kids develop self-confidence, resilience, independence? I think it, for most parents, it tends to be just a word carved in an archway. And more to the point, I think too often as parents, we unwittingly, because I completely agree with you, our hearts as parents are always in the right place. So unwittingly, we tend to undermine some of these objectives without even knowing it. And 
I think the key may be that if you could point out to parents that what you're doing right now in the name of love and help is not, in fact, helping to build some of these life skills that you say you want your daughter to have, that may give them some pause. What do you think? Yeah, well, in the new book, In the Curse of the Good Girl, I talk about two types of conversations you're having at the same time with your daughter. There's the literal conversation, which is what is actually, what are you talking about? And then there's a meta conversation, which is what are you actually teaching her in this moment? So let's take for an example, your daughter's angry at you and she stomps off down the hall to her room. Now, a lot of moms I talk to say, I hate it when my daughter's mad at me. Mm. You know, it makes me uncomfortable, it makes me sick. You know, I want to make up with her. So these moms might kind of go down the hall and knock on the door and say, honey, come on, let's talk. You know what? Let's talk. And the girl's saying, I don't want to talk. And she's saying, come on, let's talk. Now, the literal conversation that's being had there is, talk to me, let's make up. But what's the meta conversation? What is the parent actually teaching the daughter about conflict? Well, she's teaching her that conflict is something that needs to be extinguished as quickly as it begins, that it's something that's uncomfortable for this family and for this house, that even if you're angry, daughter, I'm going to continue to ask you not to be. And I'm not going to respect your need for space and your need for your negative feelings. So one way I think parents can back up a little bit and make things more just than carved in an archway is think about those meta messages that we send through our everyday actions. And this is really hard. I mean, I just want to say, I think it is so much harder to be a parent today. There are so many more factors that are pulling kids away from their parents, not the least of which is technology. And the increasing independence technology has given a lot of kids. So for parents to take a stand and do things that make them uncomfortable, which many of the things that lead to resilience precisely create discomfort in parents, you know, you have to fight against this desire to be connected to your kid. And if telling your kid no or saying, I'm not going to help you right now, makes you feel taken away from your kid, it's really, really hard. Yeah, absolutely true. And it's stressful for parents to see their kids suffering in the moment. Yeah, no, I I mean, of course it is. So the reminder of the bigger picture, what are your parenting objectives? What is the meta conversation here? And is that message really what you want your daughter to take away from this interaction? I mean, there's always a meta conversation, you know, it's like if I check your Facebook every single night and I make, I make my daughter show me her text messages every single night, (sighs) my meta message is I don't trust you. We send these big messages all the time, all the time. I'm not saying parents have to be perfect. Whoever it was who says you have to be a good enough parent, I am a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. And like I say, it's not going to be every day that you're going to be thinking about that meta message. But even if you think about it once a week, and you, you intentionally act in a way that conveys the meta message that is in line with your values, well, that's a great week. Yeah, we don't need perfection, just progress. And I think that what is bound to happen is that the mom or the dad, who's also part of this, and we can talk about that in a moment, but the mom is learning about being more authentic in her other relationships, <laughs> invariably, as she's paying attention to her relationship with her daughter. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the mother-daughter relationship is deeply fraught. It is so intense because you're seeing yourself, you know, as a mother, you're seeing yourself in your daughter, or you're not seeing yourself, which can be also equally shaking. And your daughter will often pose the most profound emotional challenge that anyone has posed to you. So I think it's really hard to have your footing and be thinking clearly about that meta conversation when you often are just struggling to be above ground and to, and to hold your ground with a daughter who's posing those kinds of challenges to you. I have a daughter and it's it's an interesting dynamic and it changes all the time. She's 30 now and the relationship we have now is, is very nurturing for both of us and I adore how it's developed. I can look back and see what it was and during her middle school and high school years especially and what it became and how my stepping back and her taking charge of her part of it has made all the difference. Absolutely. I'd like to talk about emotional intelligence, which is something that I purport as the foundation of the work that I do. And I'm also interested in the word emotion because most people don't understand what it is because traditionally girls are demonized for being too emotional. And yet in your book, you talk about emotional intelligence as part of the inner resume that is in fact missing in a lot of girls as they're reaching these crucial years. And I'd like you to define for us emotional intelligence and more to the point, how it plays out in the lives of healthy adults. 
Well, emotional intelligence has lots of different definitions depending on who you're talking to. I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, so I, so I define it as being able to know how you're feeling, say how you're feeling, and accept how you're feeling. I think I've probably come up with that definition because in my work with girls over 10 years, those are the three areas where they seem to struggle the most, knowing, saying, and accepting. Mm -hmm. So how that plays out in the lives of adults, well, the ability to control your feelings so that they don't control you is the hallmark of success in every area of one's life, whether it's your professional life or your personal life. When it comes to girls, emotional intelligence, you know, we often confuse girls having lots of feelings with their ability to manage them. Mm, that's, let's talk about that because it's like most parents wish their daughters were less emotional, had fewer feelings, less in your face kinds of feelings. Right, especially around the middle school years, girls can become really explosive with their emotions. Partly it's hormonal, developmental, you know, and in some ways, who cares? Like the point is, if you have a middle schooler, you have a kid who's able to explode really, really quickly and recover quickly, but it's there and it's pulsing in the house. And it's a big part of how she manages her everyday challenges. Again, you know, there's a myth in our culture that just because girls have lots of feelings means they must be intelligent at dealing with them. And I argue in this book and provide lots of strategies to teach girls concrete skills to know, express, and accept what they're feeling. Because if they don't have those skills, it becomes very hard for them to negotiate their relationships. And what's most important to them? Their relationships. So, you know, we can give girls a lot more independence and be more confident about their abilities in relationships if we give them those tools. So are you saying that when the 12-year-old girl is exploding and losing it at home, that she doesn't know what she's feeling? Um, she might not. Yeah, she might absolutely not know what she's feeling. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I think it's totally normal. It's just that we don't want girls only to have access to emotional self-expression at those moments. I think it's normal to do that. But girls who are explosive, in my opinion, whether it's because they're hormonal or because they've grown up in a community where being explosive is how one gets one's way, mm. to me are all signs of someone who doesn't have a deep emotional range, who doesn't have a developed emotional vocabulary or the ability to express their feelings. So, you know, we're all going to lose it at some point, and we'll all lose it in different ways. But if that's the only way that you know how to get your point across, that becomes a problem. That's really interesting. So my idea of emotional intelligence is to offer more of a palette of colors. So it's not, I'm mad, or I'm sad. Right. <laughs> and you can work with much younger kids to give them the vocabulary and the ability to know the nuances of feelings and to be able to, as you say, express it. Let's talk about the accepting part. Sure. My book is called The Curse of the Good Girl, which is about this pressure that girls face to be good. And being good doesn't create a lot of space for having negative feelings because you want to be liked and you want to be nice and you want to be friends with people. So I believe that girls grow up learning in conscious and unconscious ways to reject their negative feelings. And they tell themselves internally in their heads, I shouldn't feel this way. I'm making too big a deal out of it. If they can convince themselves that their feelings don't count, then I don't have to confront somebody. If I can convince myself that I have no right to be angry, then I don't have to go tell you what you did wrong, which is also really scary for girls. So if a girl, for example, has some kind of conflict could be a miscommunication, a misunderstanding with a friend. You describe a great one, a passing in the hall scenario where, <laughs> where um, one girl says hi to the other girl and the other girl whizzes by. And what goes on in the first girl's head as she's imagining that she has been rejected and what the ramifications of that could be. That You talk a lot about those kinds of assumptions. I thought it was quite interesting and so true to life. Yeah, really true. When you have a problem with a relationship, if you're a girl and you don't have the skills to deal with it, it kind of becomes like a bill you don't want to pay. And you sort of <laughs> see the envelope in the corner of the room. You're like, I got to pay that bill. I got, But you kind of keep walking by it and pretending that it's not there until, right, they're giving you all kinds of late fees and then they turn the electric off and or whatever it is. And so, you know, girls do the same thing with their relationships where they'll do anything not to confront someone if they feel that the cost is too high or that they don't know how to do it. And most of the time they feel some combination of both. I can't control how people react to you, but I can teach you skills to express yourself with the utmost respect so that if somebody still rejects you and still says you're mean and still says you suck or whatever they're going to say, mm -hmm. then you know, hey, you know what? I did my best and maybe you're not the right friend for me. Well, I think that's the best we can hope for. That's a great message 
that's a great message because as parents, we want too often to have our kids' friendships be nice. And we're always trying to be the peacemaker, even if the peacemaking is a cop-out, is in fact telling your daughter, okay, just apologize and you'll be friends again. When there's much more that needs to be said so that this conflict isn't just swept under the rug between these two girls who are friends and is not invariably going to come back and hit you in the back of the head again and again. So I personally worry a lot about girls who are so complacent and accepting of bad behavior from friends that they then transfer that acceptance into adult relationships and get themselves into god-awful messes and have never really learned that the price of poker may be too high. Absolutely. A long, long time ago, we should have made a very clear connection between the dynamics that crop up in girls' friendships and domestic violence, Mm. for example. Um, We don't do that. And I'll tell you why we don't do that. We don't do that because we don't take seriously the intimacy and the closeness that exists between girls and their friendships. That makes our culture uncomfortable. We would like to believe that girls reserve their strongest feelings for the boys they begin to date as they enter adolescence. The reality is girls have the most profound heartbreak and love and all of that. They get trained for their intimate dating love relationships with their female friends. Now, I'm not saying that those relationships are sexual. Of course they're not. But the basic elements of intimacy, connection, relationship, that's being forged in those female friendships. We don't honor that in girls. We, I mean, think about this, Annie. In 2002, when Queen Bees and Wannabes and Odd Girl Out came out, that was the first time two books came out that were really devoted to girls' aggression and to girls' relationships. It's astonishing because those of us who work with girls have known about this for decades. Right. But we're also talking about, I mean, academia hadn't been dealing with it. And so, you know, obviously what you learn, I mean, I think we all intuitively understand that maybe our dynamics and our spousal relationships or with our friendships as adults mirror things that went on when we were younger. We still really haven't made that connection. And I think if we did, we'd be throwing a lot more money at teaching girls the skills to navigate their everyday relationships. And I'm not talking about bullying here. Let me be really clear. I think sometimes we spend a lot, to maybe too much time talking about bullying and because it's kind of a sexy topic and not as much talking about the everyday navigation skills that you need for your social life. Yeah. From my perspective, it's about trust. And if you don't trust that you can talk to your friend because she may reject you and that's, that is worse than you're having a, an honest conversation with her that, hey, you know, I didn't like what you did. It's as if the word confrontation to them is like kryptonite. They say, no, no, I can't tell her how I really feel. Oh my God, she'd think I was mean. She'd think I wanted to ruin the friendship. She'd turn other people against me. And so I think for girls, back to the courage thing, I'm astonished when I meet a girl in a workshop situation who actually is assertive and clear about where she draws the line and what standards she has for friendships. It's so rare. So I'm going to ask you, Rachel, what, if anything, has happened since Odd Girl Out came out in 2002? We've got seven years here. Yeah, I know. Have you noticed a difference? Yeah, well, I got a lot more gray hair, I'll tell you that much. (laughs) That's one big difference I notice. Well, I think think you notice actually just, uh, there's just many more dollars now that are devoted to researching girls' aggression. I mean, just academic research has skyrocketed, and I think that's because suddenly everyone realized there was this really, really rapacious interest in understanding why girls do this. I mean, I think people were really astonished by the response to my book. I think parents in general expect now that schools should play uh, an intentional and serious role in managing girls' aggression. And I think people are less and less willing to tolerate an administrator or a teacher who says, you know, this is just how girls are, Mm. and they'll get over it. It pisses me off so much. I hear that a lot. It's part of their education. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I always say, you know, I I always say relationships are like the fourth R, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, and relationships. Good one. (laughs) I think relationships are probably the most important classroom that girls attend, really, at at least if you could measure it by how much they care about it. And there's so much to be learned there. 
that schools need to play a bigger role in because it, not least because it affects how they study. So now we're talking about a whole revamping of a section of the curriculum, not a revamping, it doesn't even exist right now in most schools. Well, for some schools it exists. I mean, I think some schools make time for social emotional learning. And some. I think that the whole SEL movement is gaining a, a lot more traction as people begin to make the link between social emotional wellness and academic achievement. But in schools that are, you know, no child left behind schools where testing becomes yeah. paramount, there is less and less bandwidth for time spent on anything related not to the testing. Exactly. And in all fairness to the teachers, we cannot assume that they are naturally equipped to teach this stuff. They're bringing their own baggage in. Yeah, they are. They are bringing their own baggage. And I think, too, that, you know, there are a lot of sympathetic teachers out there, but if you're not working in an institution that throws its weight behind you and that says, we support your work here, it can be really hard to stand up to an intimidating parent too. So there's politics there as well. It's not enough really to just be a dedicated teacher. You really need an administration that supports your work. It's important. And, you know, I love to hear you saying that you're seeing more and more um, value placed on this aspect of learning, this fourth R, because, you know, you don't have to convince me that <laughs> it. It's paramount, and if you think about it in terms of it supporting academic learning, when all this stuff is whirling around in, in girls' heads and hearts, how the hell can they focus on algebra or anything else? Right, well, they can't. They can't. Yeah, you know, they can't. It's really clear. Let's talk a little bit about your work at the Girls Leadership Institute. I would love to hear how it started and what goes on there and who can go, and is it being duplicated in other places? I know you're in Santa Cruz. Yeah, well, uh, our executive director, our office actually is, is based in Santa Cruz. GLI, as we call it, started when I was writing Odd Girl Out and are researching it, and I was invited to work at the Sidwell Friends uh, Summer Girls Leadership Program. That's a Quaker school based in Washington, D.C. I, you know, took the opportunity because I thought, yeah, it'd be cool to be around girls. And plus, like, I can't stand limp handshakes because, you know, <laughs> lots of girls and women I know have these, like, really lame handshakes. And I'm going to teach these girls how to shake hands firmly. So, you know, off I went, my kind of overly confident self, and started doing just that. And interestingly... Teaching handshakes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm going to teach these really concrete skills. Like, I'm going to teach you how to do a job interview. If you know how to do that, you'll be really successful. You'll be a good leader. So... I did all that, and, and the girls would mimic me and shake hands firmly, and they would sit and do their job interview thing. And I think what really changed it for me was asking girls how they felt about shaking hands firmly mm. or how they felt about saying what they were good at and selling themselves in a job interview. Mm. And that's how GLI was really born because it, what the girls started to say was, well, if I shake hands too firmly, people might not like me. <laughs> Or if I tell people what I'm good at in a job interview, they might think I'm conceited. And it was what girls said about how they felt about power, about how they felt about expressing themselves to the fullest extent that really caught me. And from there, I started asking girls about how they felt a good girl was expected to act and how a great leader was expected to act. And I started to see big gaps there. Mm -hmm. And then I just decided, okay, I'm going to do this. So Girls Leadership Institute happened. And we have a summer program in Western Massachusetts at Miss Hall's school. And we also do year-round programming in the Bay Area. And we hopefully will expand. The girls who go to the summer program can be ages basically 11 to 18. And we work with girls as young as 6 and 7 in the Bay Area. I have always said that GLI is a place where you can be the girl you've always wanted to be. Where you can truly be yourself and really feel what that feels like. And I think that is the most transformative thing for a girl is not just to be herself, but to act on that in the world around her and to be loved for that. And that's the transformation, I think, that people take from GLI. How does one get accepted? Is it like a, a summer camp program where they're away for a couple of weeks or something? Yeah, it's definitely like a summer camp program, but you can't come because your mom's forcing you to. We did that for a lot of years, and then we'd wind up with girls who like clearly didn't want to be there. And a lot of girls go because their moms encourage them to, but you, you do have to apply. We do need to know that you want to come or at least that you're going to get some big fat reward from your parents if you do. <laughs> no, I'm being, I'm being sarcastic. I, I think there are some girls who also want to come on their own. Look, most girls who come at the urging of their parents end up saying, thank God, it was the most wonderful thing 
but it isn't going to, you know, your regular camp where you're making macaroni necklaces. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, darn. Uh, <laughs> Nothing wrong with macaroni necklaces. Okay. I know that you're the kind of person who's very thorough in what you do. And I'm going to ask you about the follow-up you've done from your graduates of these summer programs. Yeah. Does it last? <laughs> we had some psychologists interview girls two months and nine months after their time at the Girls Leadership Institute. And um, it does seem to hold up. I can't speak beyond that. It's not very longitudinal. But we did see big increases in emotional intelligence, in, in self-efficacy, in nonviolent conflict resolution. There were significant gains made in those areas, um, even close to a year after they left. Have you thought about making a documentary movie about Girls Leadership Institute? Not really, although the woman who made The Education of Shelby Knox Rose Rosenblatt came to one of my talks and said, I'd like to make a movie out of this. So we're behind her all the way. We hope she wants to do it too. I think there's a lot to say here, but I also would worry about bringing cameras into GLI because we want to make sure girls feel comfortable. And for that reason, we've never allowed media to come in, even though we've been asked many times. I would like you now, if you wouldn't mind, to read a plan that you have towards the end of your book. It's a chapter called From Perfect Mothers to Real Mothers. And and obviously focuses on the strongest role model that most girls have growing up is their mom and how moms can better guide their daughters towards this real girl versus a good girl. Read us the plan, please. Okay. To deepen your vision for your daughter, write her a letter. You don't have to send it and explore these questions. What do you wish you'd known when you were her age? Think about the girl you used to be and the woman you are today. Focus on what you've learned about relationships, conflict, and self-confidence. Next question, what does being yourself mean to you? And the third question is, what did the female role models of your childhood teach you? If you didn't have any, what do you wish you might have learned from a caring adult woman? You've learned many lessons in your life. By defining them for yourself, you can begin thinking about how to convey practical wisdom to your daughter in both what you say and how you act. That's great. If you don't mind, I'm going to excerpt that and put it at the bottom of my blog post that talks about this interview. I think that's a wonderful exercise for moms and just will make them more conscious about the direction they're going in with their teaching. I am a firm believer that parenting is teaching. I definitely think it is. And I also think parenting is dynamic and it's not all about from me to you. Right. There's definitely a transaction happening there. Girls teach us every day about how to be in the world. My colleague and friend, Elizabeth Diebold, who's written about girls and women, says we need to live as if girls are watching. And I think that's a really lovely way to think about it. I like that too. Thank you very much, Rachel, for taking time to be with us You've written a book that I am delighted to have read and feel very proud to be able to promote because it's important, it's real, it's authentic, and I think anybody reading it can learn something really important in their role as parent, mentor, teacher to girls. Well, thanks, Annie. I appreciate that. Thanks for everything you're doing. You're very welcome. Oh, one more thing before we close. Can you please tell us where we can get more information about the book, your work at the Girls Leadership Institute, and anything else you'd like people to know about you? Where can they find that information? You can get weekly blogs for girls and adults and what I call girl tips at my website, rachelsimmons.com. And you can find out everything you've ever wanted to know about the Girls Leadership Institute at girlsleadership.org. Terrific. My guest has been Rachel Simmons, author of The Curse of the Good Girl, Raising Authentic Girls with Courage and Confidence. Thanks again, Rachel. Good luck. Thanks. I'm Annie Fox for Family Confidential. For more information about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, visit AnnieFox.com. And tune in next time when my guest, Izzy Rose, will discuss her new book, The Package Deal, My Not-So-Glamorous Transition from Single Gal to Instant Mom. Till then, happy parenting! Happy parenting!